Bible here. I'm going to put my Bible right on the ground there. That's not sacrilegious. That's just uh, helping it to not get all messed up. That's not sacrilegious at all. See what we can do. Hey, good morning, everybody. All right. Uh, it's a little hot out today, but not too bad. We got a little bit of shade. And uh, I got to play my other guitar today because uh, I got a, a funny thumb. So we're going to be good. Um, let's pray and let's uh, just ask that God does some great things in our midst today. God, we thank you for meeting us here in the park. God, we ask that you would, uh, that you would bless us. God, that you would challenge us. God, we pray that as we uh, leave this place, God, that we be more like Jesus when we leave than when we came. And God, we love you. God, we love you. We worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up if you're able.
God, we just ask you to meet us in this place, God. We pray that you would just bless us, God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that you transform us, God. Begin to even as we worship, God, begin to work on our hearts. God, to transform us into the people you want us to be. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. You give life. You give life. You are love. Bring light to the darkness you give home. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, We worship you, Lord. It's your breath in our lives. speak to him. Just take a minute to share your needs with him. Share the desires of your heart. Whether they're good or bad, just share those with God. If they're bad, confess them to him. If they're good, just praise him. Praise you, God.
Uh oh, broke a string. Uh, just keep worshiping. And I'm not afraid. God, we praise you. Just fill this place with your spirit, God. Just inhabit our praises, God. Here we go. You. you 
deep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are we make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. As we, as we preach the Word of God this morning, as we gather here, God, that you would bind us together. Uh, even though we're separated by a little distance, God, that you'd bind us together uh, in spirit and in heart. God, that as we study your Word this morning, God, that it would challenge us and change us. God, we're asking in anticipation for what you're going to do. God, we sit here waiting for something marvelous to happen in our midst, God. God, we ask that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, I'm going to have uh, my friend Jeff make his way up here. And uh, how about our kiddos? We got any kids here ready for children's sermon? Come on up for children's sermon. We're ready for children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody? Everybody's great? We're here with the presence of Jesus, right? What do I have in my hand? A flashlight. What's, what's the flashlight allow you to do? See. Allows you to see. So some night when you're at home and you left that toy outside and you say, Dad, I need to go find that toy, what's he going to give you? flashlight to go out and find that toy. Helps us see in the dark, right? Yes. What's it take to run a flashlight? Batteries. 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 And also power. And power, yep. Do you, think, do you think if I took this banana and put it in the flashlight it would light the flashlight? No. 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 Do, you, do you think if I took these rocks and pour them into the flashlight, that that would make the flashlight work? No. no. How about these pens? If I took some pens and put them in the flashlight? No. No, none of them, none of them would, would make the, the flashlight work. It takes, takes batteries, right? Yes. In the book of John, chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 8 through 12. For you were once darkness... But now you are the light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What Jesus is telling us here 
is that you guys and all of us, we are the flashlight. Jesus is the batteries. Jesus is what makes us be able to go out and preach the gospel. He is what teaches us what we need to be doing to live our lives. So we need to be learning as much about Jesus as we can. We need to learn that from Pastor Dustin, from our church family, from our parents who know Jesus. Because with, with knowing Jesus, and as we all get older, and we all start reading and learning the Bible, we will be able to go out and walk and, and be the flashlight and shed that light out for others to know Jesus. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Great. Let, it, let us all pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to share today with these children. Thank you for allowing us for to share and to be able to share your words with them. They are all going to grow up to be mighty warriors for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. That's a good banana there. All right. Well, hey, hopefully you got a, you got a bulletin as you came in. Um, came in. What is that? You got a bulletin as you came in. Uh, you should have got one. I just want to run through a couple announcements before we have our friend uh, um, Jim come up here and lead us in prayer. Just a few things that I want to let you. Uh, there's some things that are on the front. So if you look at it, you'll see we've got a, a uh, some, some, I guess some folks showed up to go fishing yesterday, but we never really got permission to go to the fishing place or something like that. So that's why we wasn't there. There wasn't. But we are doing uh, disc golf. So get a disc golf and we'll have the tournament. And uh, I'm going to go uh, practice all week. Uh, to do that. And then evangelism training. Anybody do evangelism training? Uh, go online and look at that. Anybody? A few of you did. So if you didn't, uh, you can go back and you can listen. Uh, this week will be a new one. It'll be at 7 o'clock. And you just go to our Facebook page, Facebook Live, and it'll be on there and you can watch and you can kind of learn. And uh, last week, the basic gist of it, uh, the basic gist of what we discussed is that the common gospel that you're often taught um, or that you hear is basically... If you'll give your life to Jesus, he'll make you happy. He'll make you uh, uh, fulfilled. He'll uh, give you peace. Uh, and your life will just be way better. That's the basic gist of it. And so if you want to have Jesus in your life, what you should do is you should pray this prayer. And when you pray this prayer, now you're not going to go to hell. You're going to go to heaven. And uh, the problem with that, that style of doing evangelism is that it doesn't really present to you the main problem that you have. The main problem is actually this, that, that you violated the Ten Commandments. We start with the law. Right? When we present the gospel, we start with the law and say, listen, this is the law. Have you ever, have you ever uh, broken any of the Ten Commandments? Have you ever disobeyed God? That's why there's so much of the Old Testament and so much littler of the, of the New Testament. Because he wants to explain to you, God wants to explain to you that you are sinners. You violated his law. And that puts you in jeopardy. Right? God has to do that. So we, when we do evangelism, our, our main point last week was... Uh, make sure that we share the law first so that people actually make a genuine decision. They are, they are understanding that there is good news about Jesus because there was actually bad news to make this, good, this news good. All right, There is bad news first. The bad news is that we are sinners, that we are fallen from God, that we have broken commandments and we have, we have uh, violated God's law. If we don't understand that, the good news means nothing. The good news is that because we have violated God's law, that God is perfect, God still loved us enough to give his son Jesus to die in our place. That, that's the good news about Jesus. And so we talked about that on here as well. And uh, you can go take a look at that if you'd like. Um, also, you'll notice on here, sometimes I have folks that come in, they, they don't really know what the, about the communication card. So the back side of this is actually a communication card. It actually tears off like this. And so if you got a pin, if you don't have a pin, we used to have pins. I don't know what happened to our pins. I think we ate them. People would eat the pins. They'd chew on them. I don't know why that is. I, Jeff will find you a pen, right? But if you do get a pen, don't eat it, right? Don't chew on it. If, actually, if you do chew on it, that's your free gift from us. You keep that. Don't give that back to us. We don't need that pen back. So just uh, keep that. But fill this out. Let us know you're here. We'll get you on the mailing list so you can know what kind of activities, what kind of stuff's going on. We had some prayer we needed to be praying for uh, this week, several things. And so we'll send those out uh, if there's things that we need to pray for. But anyway, that's what that's about. We want you to be a part of our church family and let you know all the stuff that's coming up. Our plan is to be outside through September, okay? 
So if you're wondering, when are you gonna go inside? Well, the plan is to not go in until probably end of September, or, and then uh, probably early October. It depends, if it starts snowing, we'll probably go inside. But I, I can't guarantee that. I'm not making any promises about anything, but that's the, that's the plan there. And then uh, we don't. Have, we had a good prayer meeting uh, this last Monday. There's not one this Monday, but the following Monday. So every other Monday for a while, we're going to be having prayer, and it's great. Uh, we just kind of sat there in God's presence, and uh, for some of us, it was it was it was kind of uncomfortable because you're sitting there and it's just quiet, and we're just sitting there listening and just waiting for God. And sometimes it'd be like ten or ten minutes of silence, and but it was great. It was really good. Just uh, if you want to have. Uh, just a lot of peace in, in that time, so love to have you there. So, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to my friend uh, Jim, and Jim's going to lead us in prayer. Well, one thing we do need to make sure you pray for, uh, Dave, uh, Dave and Cheryl Lee. You may have saw that one, uh, Lichtards. They have um, he had an angiogram, and she sent me a message that went really well. So I think we're in good shape. But then we should still continue to pray for them because uh, that's a that's kind of an ongoing problem, I think. So we'll keep praying for that. Good morning. Am I on? Well, good. First, I'd like to share with you a little story of going up to uh, Minnesota here a couple of weeks ago. We're going down the highway coming out of Cedar Rapids, and suddenly my whole truck shimmied. And I looked back and and I'd looked at the trailer tires, they really weren't that old. But the left tire blew the whole cap off. Pieces just flew. And so we continued on and the, the tire's up, but it's running on the steel belts. And I said, Lord, get us where we need to be because I've changed tires on the interstate before and that's not a fun deal. So where we normally go to lunch at a McDonald's, we pulled into McDonald's, I backed underneath the shade tree, tire still up. And I said, thank you, Lord. So we put on the spare tire, took off towards Waterloo. We were coming out of Waterloo. Suddenly my truck shimmied. And I looked back and I said, no, in the right tire, the whole cap blew off. And I said, Lord, I need to get some place that I can put new tires on. And there was no place there. There's no place even to get off the interstate. So we continued on. And there was an exit by Waverly. So we were looking on our phones for a tire, you know, Farm Fleet, Farm King, something. And we come out into Waverly. And Len said, you were supposed to meet that corner back there. And needless to say, I wasn't really pleased or happy or joyful at the time. So we take the next left, and we're driving through this housing addition. It was really a nice housing addition. So we come up to the road we were going to be on, and I make a right, look off the hill, and it says Waverly Tire Shop. And I said, there's no way. So I pulled into there, thinking it's going to be all afternoon, you know, to get a couple tires put on. Guy come out with a big grin. He says, you need trailer tires. And I said, I sure do. He said, well, we got them back into that second, win or that second door. He says, come, in, come on in and pay for your tires. By that time, the boys will be done and you can go. I wasn't there 10 minutes. So, what's the moral of the story here? We pray for the big things, but we don't pray for small things. And even though this could have been a big thing, just by making communication with God, he kept both of them tires up running on the steel belts for like 30 miles. One tire 15 and the next tire probably 15. Wow. And what would have happened if I wouldn't have communicated with God? Probably not. I've never had a cap blow off before that stayed up. You know, within a, within a very short distance, they go flat. So anyway, 
prayer time. Communication with God. Be in constant communication with God. Oh, the thrill of it. I was handed one paper and it says, pray for Harley Hepner with health concerns. So let's pray for him a minute. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with Harley. We don't know what his health concerns are, but we know, Lord, that you are more than capable of taking care of all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. And there's another one for Unity Point Clinic in Geneseo that is opening their new location tomorrow. So uh, let's pray for that a minute. Lord, we pray that uh, as they open that people can come there and can be cured of their problems or helped with their issues. We ask, Lord, that you be with the workers and the, and the doctors and the nurses. Give them all wisdom on dealing with the physical parts of the body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then as Dustin said with uh, Dave and Cheryl Lee, let's pray for them. Lord, let's, we ask, Lord, that you are the great physician. You heal, you cure, but you also take life. We pray, Lord, that you be with them, that you heal their problems, and that they can soon rejoin us healthy and loving you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So other prayer re requests. Pardon me. So that's your daughter? My daughter asked, yes. Okay. So if you didn't all hear that, uh, EJ's daughter Ashley <coughs> and three others were moving a doghouse. And uh, the dog didn't like his doghouse being moved evidently and, and bit her. Uh, but she got that cured. It was up here in her forehead. But they think she broke her foot also. So let's pray for her. Dear Lord, we come to you again with uh, Ashley. We pray, Lord, that uh, you heal her foot, heal her wounds, but more, Lord, that you bring her heart to yourself, that she may worship you, and that she can see that her healing was indeed by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Nick. Absolutely. Lord, we do ask that you prepare our hearts, that you prepare our minds, that you give us wisdom and discernment as Dustin preaches the word. Help us to follow your word. Help us to take your word and use it but moreover, Lord, that we become unified as a church in direction. And what you have us to do, your purpose, that we can accomplish this purpose. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anything else? Thank you for healing yeah, thank you for healing Dustin's thumb. He could squeeze the neck of the guitar a little better this morning. <laughs> so let's pray for that and go to prayer for a minute and then we'll I'll hand it back to Dustin. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do thank you for healing Dustin's thumb that he can again play his guitar in worship. I pray, Lord, that you feel, fill him with your spirit that you fill us as a church with your spirit. That we may go about this life and this world and this community with your word. 
knowing that it's by you that people are saved. Give us the desire for people to come to see you and to come worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together, that we can praise your name. Another thing that I was told this morning, it's, isn't it wonderful that every Sunday morning we are able to worship you outside here in the great outdoors? We thank you, Lord, for this. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. I, I like that story. Jim came in and told me that story about uh, about his, uh, his tires earlier in the week, and I was like, you got to share that story. That's a pretty good story. I like that. So um, I'll tell you what. Uh, how many of you, uh, when we started Acts last week, thought to yourself, hey, I, that, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of cool. I like kind of where God's kind of moving us as a church. I had some folks that, that uh, commented back and said, uh, they like kind of what God's doing and kind of where God's heading us. And uh, this idea of us uh, starting to reach uh, reach our community, that's really our goal as a church. Our goal is a little different than um, a lot of other churches around, and that's our specific goal right here. We're a church in the country, and we're trying to reach people in the country, right? We're trying to pe reach people in the small towns around here. That's our, that's our mission. That's our, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. So... Um, just want to say thank you for praying. It actually looks really good. So come on, you can come up anytime you want. It's just kind of, uh, for those who don't know, I was in a bizarre uh, uh, chess tournament ca accident. No, no, I was, I was, uh, no, what happened, I was uh, being really, really very careless with a table saw. And my thumb went right into it. I, it kind of kicked back at me. I decided I was stronger than the saw. I kicked into it. And the next thing you know, uh, there's blood all over everywhere. And and my wife is driving me to the ER, and and uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's been I don't know 12 days, I guess 12 or 13 days now, and it's uh, looking feeling pretty feeling pretty pretty good. Can't feel it too much, so um, doesn't look good. I had to give up my hand modeling job, but other than that, we're doing all right. So hey, we've been looking at the Book of Acts. If you're new to us as a church, what we do at our church. Um, is that we kind of go through books of the Bible, okay? We believe that this this uh, this book is actually God's word, okay? We believe that this is, in a very real sense, God's word. Uh, that's how we hear from God. Most of the time, it's just through this word that he gave us. We believe it's inspired. We also believe that it is, inf that it is infallible, that it is inerrant, okay? Which means that we can trust what's in this book. And this tells us a lot about ourselves, and it tells us a lot about God, okay? And those two are related when it comes to us. Knowing and understanding ourselves is very important for us as we look at God because God, we want to see things in God's light because God's smart. God understands everything. God's true, and he understands us. So we study the books of the Bible because this is where we believe truth is, okay? Uh, we don't believe that Pastor Dustin can go home and watch the news and get truth. We believe that Pastor Dustin can't go to CNN, and get truth. He can't go to Fox News and get truth. He can't go anywhere to get real truth, except he needs to go here and compare it. And so we spend time as a church studying this because this directs us and leads us. And since we've been following this book, and since we've been doing our best to, to just obey God and his word, it's been good. It's been good. And I see God doing some great things. I am very, very blessed. I'm a very blessed person to have you as a church. Just very blessed. Um, we have a group of people at this church that really passionately love God. They want to know God. They are passionate about a mission. They're passionate about other people knowing the living God like they know the living God. Okay, And that's our mission. That's cool. There's a lot of places where you go and that's not the case. Where you go and it's a club and you, you sit there and you just kind of enjoy and, and uh, you, know, you enjoy each other. It's all about uh, us four and no more. And that's not, our, that's not what we're about here. We're about reaching the community with the gospel. And to do that, we're looking at the book of Acts because that is the first church. It's, we call it, we're calling it vintage church, if you looked at your bulletin. Vintage church is if we want to know how we're supposed to function within the power of God, within the Holy Spirit, we need to look back to the vintage church. And today is a tough one for me. Today's a tough one because today has to do with waiting. How many of you are good waiters? You like waiting for stuff? I know Josh Elmer is great at waiting on things. Isn't that right, Carrie? What do you think? I gotta ask all the women, all the wives. Annie, is Nick good at waiting? He's a good waiter. Yeah, does he wait on you a lot? 
He does good for good for him. That's right. That's good. That's good. We ask all the guys, are you good at waiting? I, I am. I am horrible at waiting. I'm just the worst. My wife will tell you, I just, I can't do it. I'm one of those guys that just, he wants to, he wants to get his work done, you know, and while I'm working, um, I know what I'm supposed to do. So as I know what I'm supposed to do, I just want to do it. If I know what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't want to wait around, right? And yet when we look at the Bible, that's what we're going to see. They know their mission. They know what they're supposed to do. And then they're just waiting. You're like, man, this is a nightmare. I remember, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, this is a side and this doesn't matter at all, but I'll tell you anyway. You know what really I have, Jeff, you'll appreciate this. When I'm at the grocery store and I'm in line and the two people in front of me are both in their early 130s and they both pay with a check and they don't got a pin. That just drives me nuts. I'm like, man, I got to get somewhere and this person can't find a pin and they're, they're paying like the way we paid back in the early 1930s and I, I just get frustrated. You know, I, I'm not patient that way. I have a trouble, trouble doing that. Um, it's just brutal. Some of, the, some of the girls here, you don't like waiting. You're like, I wish I had a boyfriend. I wish I had a boyfriend. And you're waiting for your boyfriend because you're waiting for someday that you can get engaged, right? And, and then someday you'll be engaged and then you're waiting that you got to wait. Well, when you get engaged, then you got to wait, right? That's what happens when you get engaged. You wait. And then, then you finally get married. And then you, I wish I, I can't wait to have a baby. And we just wish and we wish and we wish. We wait. We don't want to wait for these great things, right? And God, God's prepping us for stuff as we wait, right? Probably the worst waiting I ever had to do in my life, and this is a little bit personal, but you guys know that I'm a little bit nuts. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. And several years ago, I, was, I had to get off. I got off the medication I was on because it stopped working. And here's how it works with those medications is that uh, you go on it and then you wait. You wait to see if it works, right? It's not like you wait a day. It could take, it takes some four to six weeks for that stuff to actually work. So you'll go on a medication, you'll taper onto it, and then you're on it for four to six weeks. And then after like eight weeks, you're like, this isn't working. So then you got to taper off that for a few weeks and then taper onto something new. It can take a year for a medication to work and the whole time you're in misery. And that's what it was for me, just the waiting. It was like, man, I can't wait anymore, right? The waiting is miserable, right? The other thing that I don't enjoy waiting for is when we go shopping, Especially with my mom, not with Julie. Julie's good. But with my mom, I go shopping, you know, I'll go with her. And all I do the whole time is wait, right? Because I'm not shopping. When there's a guy, we just, we're just waiting, right? Just waiting for you to get done shopping. So you want to go shopping with me? Yeah, sure, I'd love to go wait, right? That's my job, to go wait. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 to 26 today. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to it. I've got mine open. And here's what it says. Here's what it says. It says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. All right. So actually, let's, let's kick back a little bit. Give us a little context. Let's go back to verse 8. It said, This is from last week. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what did God do? God gave them the actual mission, what they're going to do. He told them what you're going to do, right? Right up front. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in uh, Samaria, and Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. He also told them, and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit first. So they know everything that's going to happen. What is there to wait for? Right? Right? If you are type A, and I'm sure that some of these were type A disciples. I don't know if I've ever heard that said before, but type A disciples. There had to be some type A disciples that were thinking, well, we know what we're supposed to do. Let's get them, let's get them move on, right? Let's get going. Let's, let's make a strategy. Let's figure out how we're going to witness to all the people in, in Jerusalem, at least get started there. And they're trying to figure this out. But he told them to wait. So that's their mission. And it says here in verse, in verse 12, it says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. Because what happened is just before that, uh, they, were, they were hanging out with Jesus. They were walking. Jesus had given them this thing. And then the next thing you know, Jesus is flying. He's floating like out of nowhere, like a balloon. He just starts floating in the air. Right? And, they, and they're looking up and they're like, there goes Jesus. Right? And then a cloud comes and covers them up. Now, some people look at that and they say, well, where did he go? 
right? Where'd Jesus go? He went up. He went up. So where did he go to? Did he go like into outer space? Is, if he kept going, he's probably to Pluto by now. Although I don't think that's a planet. I don't know. But he's cruising up. He could, no, Jesus went up into the sky and then he was covered by a cloud and then he, he moved on to the other dimension or to wherever he is. Remember, Jesus can, with his glorified body, he, he would just kind of appear and disappear. He could do that. So he is in heaven with the Father right now. That's where he is. He's not up in outer space, right? He ascended. And the whole point of him ascending and showing us that he ascended is he says, I am they say he's going to descend. He's going to come back in the same way he went. He's going to return from the sky. That's how Jesus will return. And that could happen any moment. That could happen in the middle of our service. That could happen 10 days from now. It could happen 100 days from now. It could happen any time. And if we're not ready for that return, if we have not accepted Christ as into our life as our Savior, if we have not recognized that we're a sinner, we've violated that, but God has made the way for us to have a relationship, we will be in big trouble when Jesus returns, when he comes down from the sky. And so they watch Jesus go. They watch him cruise up into the sky. And as they're watching him uh, cruise from the sky, he leaves and somebody probably says, hey, let's get going. We need to go back. And they head back to Jerusalem. And it says here, it says that uh, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. So that's really close because the Jews wouldn't let you walk very far on the Sabbath. They had all kinds of rules and they, you know, what, what, what is considered work, right? Well, if you walk this far, it's not considered work. If you walk that far, it is considered work. That's how dumb it was. And they made up these kind of rules. And so it's really close. They go back to Jerusalem about a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Didn't take them long. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. So this is an upper room. We don't know what room this is. It could have been the upper room that they were at before, which actually I'd, I'd read something that made that kind of interesting. It's possible that Jesus actually had rented, whether this is true or not, I don't know, but could it be possible that the upper room where they had the Lord, the Last Supper, that Jesus rented that room for the whole time that he was dead, was on earth, and then for the time that they would be until the Holy Spirit had come? I'd heard somebody say that that could be the case. Don't know. Don't even know it's the same room. But what these upper rooms look like is, how many of you have a house that has a flat roof? Anybody of you have a house with a flat roof or have a part of a flat roof? You know, Anybody? Um, a little bit of a f part of a flat roof. What they would do is they would build these buildings and they had flat roofs and they were, they, were, they were like this. And then they would build a section on top of that flat roof that would be like an upstairs on it. And they wouldn't finish it usually. It'd be just kind of like, like a place where, and they'd rent it out maybe to somebody that's poor that needed a place to stay. But you could rent them and it was, it was just a little area, but it was upstairs. And so they go up into this place and they're going to wait. Watch what it says. It says, when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, James, Peter, John, James, and Andrew, semicolon. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, semicolon. James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together in constant prayer along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. The order's different than this. If you go back and you read the order, uh, when, when the order of the disciples is listed before, like when they become disciples, different order. The, and they, and they, they list the order of disciples oftentimes, not by who's the oldest, who's the youngest, like that. Um, they're listing it, because before they grouped it by brothers. Here, it's not grouping them by brothers. It's listing them by order of kind of who's the most important. They were really, uh, they were really big on when they were with Jesus, asking this question, which of us is the greatest? Right? Which of us is the greatest? Well, here, it's listed out kind of in order of importance and in order of kind of who is, uh, who's the most responsible and who's going to be kind of leading this show here. And here's what it says. It says uh, and it groups them into groups. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simeon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. You see that name Judas? How would you like to have the name Judas? Like you're one of Jesus' disciples, right? And say, what's your name? Judas. You're Judas? Oh, dude. Oh, man. Aren't you the one that... Well, no, I didn't because my guts didn't fall out. I'm here, right? I'm not that Judas. Well, you must be somehow related to him or something. No, I'm not Judas. Right? Just think of having that name of Judas. 
And, and he's, he, he's in this list, but the problem is we only got 11 disciples. That's the problem. There's only 11 of them. And uh, there was 12, right? In the Old Testament, we had uh, 12 tribes of Israel, okay? You ever think that might have some kind of correlation with the 12 apostles? It says in Scripture that the 12 apostles will judge the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But all of a sudden here, we only got 11 because one of them died. How did Judas die? Judas had sold Jesus down the river. Jesus was a part of the murder plan for Christ. He was the guy who figured out where Jesus was going to be. And though he pretended to be like he was a believer, he pretended to be like he was one of, one of God's uh, Jesus' disciples. He wasn't. He wasn't. People ask me sometimes, they say, hey, Dustin, was Judas, was Judas, did he fall away? Was he a Christian that fell away? No, he wasn't a Christian that fell away. He was a person that pretended like he was a, he was, he was stealing from Jesus the entire time. The whole purpose of him following Jesus was so that he could, he could just make money on the side. It was all about money. It was all about Judas, not about Jesus, right? So he was never a believer. And it says also in scripture, here's another thing. Uh, it says the one, it'll talk about the one appointed for this, right? So it was ahead of time. We knew, God knew this guy was going to do this. Did he cause him? To deny Jesus? No. Did he know? Yes. Was it preordained that it would happen? Yes. How does that work? I don't know. All right, here we go. Let's keep going. It says, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Okay? Uh, if you look at John... Chapter 17, I'll just read a passage from John 17. It's verse 21 to 23. This is Jesus praying for the disciples before he leaves, before he's going to ascend, before he's crucified, actually. And it says that all, this is his prayer, that all of them may be one. That's what he's, he's praying to, to his father. Jesus on earth is praying to his daddy, saying, I pray that all these disciples, that they would be one, Father, just as you and me and I and you, may you also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to unity, complete unity. Then the world would know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What's the point here? The point is that they're trying, God wants, Jesus wants unity for his church. That is a really big deal for God. Division in his church is not good. He wants unity. He wants them bound together. And so what does he do? He says, go up into, uh, into this upper room and wait. Wait there. What are you going to do when you wait? That's the question I've got. I'm sitting here. I'm thinking, God, what do we do when we wait? We're waiting for you to tell us what to do. You're waiting for us to, to know how to respond as a church. What do we do when we're waiting, right? Well, the first thing it says in verse 14, it says to join constantly Join together constantly in prayer. When they're waiting, even if you know what you're supposed to do, if God said to wait, you wait, and you start to pray. Pray for what? Isn't that a good question? What are you supposed to pray for? Are they supposed to pray that the Holy Spirit comes? Well, why would you pray that? God already said the Holy Spirit's going to come. Are you supposed to pray that power would come down from heaven? Well, why would you pray for that? You already know power is coming down from heaven. God, Jesus already told you that. Are you, to pray, are you supposed to pray that God would give you a mission? A mi what kind of mission? Mission to be his, uh, his uh, testimony, his, his witnesses all around? Is that what we're supposed to do? Pray for that? Yeah, I already know that. What are they praying for? They're praying for each other. Unity is a very, very, very important thing in church. Extremely. If you take our church membership class, I dive in and I just pour out the need for us to be united. A lot of things we did in the last 15 months were all about us uniting as a church. But it says to pray, right? The key to unity and the key to, pray, the key to reconciliation is prayer. Did you know that, EJ? I don't know if you knew that. Some of you say, I've got real problems in relationships. I've got problems right now in my relationship with my, with my brother. I've got, relation, I've got a problem with somebody in the church with that relationship. 
I've got problems with this person's posting all kinds of stuff that makes me mad and now I don't like them at all and, and you're like, I got all this issue with them and, and I can't have unity with them. I've got, I've got this problem with my mother, my father, with my sister, with my brother. I've got this person at work and I've got this problem. There's no unity at all. How do you fix that? Come on, church. You know the answer to this. If you've got a problem, then you need to start to pray for that person. Right? Does that sound hard? You're like, Dustin, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't pray for that person. Oh, you know what? I've got this major relationship issue and this is an important relationship, but I just, I, I'm just sick of them. Well, you know what? What does God want you to do? Well, God wants there to be unity. What did Jesus do to cause unity? He prayed. So all of a sudden I get up and I'm not even, I don't even like you. I don't even like you. Arr, I'm mad at you. I don't like you. But I'm going to pray for you. God, I pray for that person I don't like. Arr. God, I want to pray that you'd strike them with lightning right now. God, I'm praying, God, that you would, that you would bless them. I'm praying that you would change their heart. God, I am really praying that the best would be for them. All of a sudden, my, what, what does prayer change? Does prayer change God? Did God all of a sudden change his mind? Did God all of a sudden just change your, so, oh, you know, well, since you prayed, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I'm just, I'm changing everything because of the Almighty Dustin. Your prayers have have caused me to just change myself as God. No. No, I start praying for people, and th the next thing I care about that person, because God, a lot of what we do in prayer is it's changing us inside of us. So so all of a sudden, you know, I don't care about people. I don't care about people in India. I don't care about them. I don't care that they're they're over. I, I don't have a heart for that. But God says, I want you to care about people in India. So I start praying for people in India. And I get up in the morning, I'll spend time and I'll say, God, I, and all of a sudden I start to care about that during the day. All of a sudden my heart changes. And so these disciples, they're praying up there together, praying for one another. They're praying that God would, God would do great things through each other and through their, they're, they're praying for one another. And what's God doing when, he, when, he, when they pray for each other? They're unifying each other. Here's assignment number one for every one of you today. If you're here and you're saying, I have these relationship problems. If the other person's a believer, say, listen, Pastor Dustin said that we need to get together and pray with each other. I don't like that, but I, I, I'm willing to do it if you will, right? Or if that won't work, then say, I'm just going to pray on my own. I'm going to pray on my own. I'm going to pray for that person until God either changes that person or changes me. But God's going to change something, right? Because he's creating unity. What are they doing? They're waiting. But in the midst of waiting, great things are happening in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit hasn't even showed up yet. And, and great things are happening in the body of Christ. They know exactly what's going to happen. So we go to verse 15. Let's say it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers. Now why is Peter standing up? Peter's standing up because he's a leader of a church. You say, well, how'd he get that job? He must, he must have had to do some politicking for that, right? He probably got out and, and uh, made some signs and, and did something to make sure that he could be in a position of power so that he could run the church and be the first pope. Well, first of all, he wasn't the, that's not how it works. It's not like he was just the first pope or anything like that. Uh, that's something the Catholic Church created later with, with the pope, right? That was about uh, quite a bit later, actually. Uh, this this succession back to Peter. What I can tell you though about Peter is that he got his job from Jesus, right? He got his job from Jesus. Who appointed the leaders in the early church? God did. Jesus did. How did he pick Peter? Peter denied him. He comes back. He forgives Peter as he repents and turns back to God. And God says, y y feed my sheep, right? It's really important. He, he's laying this out. And so it says, Peter stands up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. 120 people in the early church. So that the vintage church, how many folks were in the vintage church? 120. That's more than we've got right now, right? We'll get there. We'll get there. We're moving in that direction. But that's how many were in the early church. Interesting though, because I was thinking about this. And if you go back uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
It's talking about people that saw Jesus resurrected, people that saw that he was alive. And here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, Though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. How many people did he appear to? 500. How many people are in the early church? 120. All right, so some of you went to public school. 500, right? Minus 120. How many people believed, physically saw Jesus' body? Right? They saw him eat. They saw him do that. And they're not in the church. All right? Public school here. 500 minus 120. Right? That's 380. The majority of the people who saw Jesus are not a part of the early church. Why? Because they don't believe in Jesus? They don't believe that Jesus really is alive? That's not why. They're not a part of the early church because they don't want to follow Jesus. That's not, that's not, they just don't want to follow him. Sometimes people just don't want to follow Jesus. They know what following Jesus means. They look at following Jesus and there's a cost to following Jesus. They're like, man, they're out to kill these guys that are following Jesus. They're out to arrest these guys following Jesus. I don't want anything to do with that. I'd be better off just knowing about Jesus, but I'm not going to follow him. Okay? So there's a lot of people not doing that. And it's the same today. People hear the gospel, uh, but they just, they just don't go forward with it, right? So, we're looking at Peter. Peter stands up. We had Judas before. You remember Judas? What did Judas do? He, he denied Jesus. He sold Jesus out. So what? He denied him. He was a part of the murder scheme for Jesus. And then we have Peter here. They're basically, uh, well... We'll get to that in a little bit. I, I'm going to tell you that they're, they're, uh, they had the same pastor. They had the same small group. They had a lot of the same stuff. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? What happened? What's happening? How could that affect you and I? So while we wait, let's look at this. While we wait, the first thing we have to do while we wait, if we're going to be like the vintage church, is we need to join together constantly in prayer. Okay? We need to start praying. We do not as a church pray nearly as much as we need to pray, okay? And I confess, I don't pray as much as I need to pray. But God is calling us as a church to prayer, okay? And I don't mean just like shooting something up here and there. I'm talking about spend some time with God and just say, God, change me. God, prepare the way for us. God, unite us as a church. What's God going to do in that prayer? I don't know. He's going to do what's necessary, but we're not going to have prayer this Monday night, but the Monday after we'll have prayer again. I want as many of you as, ca as can to come and gather with us. 7 p.m., you can pray with us, okay? If there's a lot of people, we'll come outside. Uh, it's nice to be outside. We'll be outside if we can, and uh, we'll spend some time praying. Uh, they also, number two, while they were waiting, they joined together in fellowship. They were all together. It says they were all together. The church, while it's waiting, is supposed to be together. We're supposed to be together, right? Do you like each other? Hope so. Hope so, because you're kind of stuck with each other, right? Kind of stuck with each other. You're stuck in the upper room together, waiting for God. You're all in this together, waiting to see what God's going to do and where he's going to lead us so that when, 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 the, when he gives us the go, we're all ready, right? He's uniting us because we're praying, but then we're spending time together. When we're not praying, we're spending time together. We're getting to know each other. We're building relationships. God's unifying us. And the third thing that happens is that Peter stands up and he teaches them from Scripture. Okay? Here's the three things that I want you to understand out of Acts, this passage today. When we are waiting, three things need to happen. We need to spend time in prayer, constantly in prayer, praying for God and what he's going to do, praying for each other. We need to be constantly in fellowship, spending time together, building relationships together. And your leaders need to be preaching to you from Scripture. Okay? Pre preaching from Scripture. Watch what happens here. 
It says in uh, verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled. What does he do? He immediately goes to preach to them by going to scripture. He goes to the Bible. What Bible? Old Testament. That's all he's got, right? The scripture had to be fulfilled. He is looking, what do we do in this time while we're waiting? I don't know what to do. I'm the leader, but I don't know what to do. I guess I'll go and I'll look and see what scripture says about the things that are happening right now in our midst. What's the major thing that's happening in our midst right now as an early church? Uh, in the vintage church, what's happening? One of their best buddies helped murder their best friend. That causes problems, right? That's not, that's not good. They're like, what in the world is going on here? This, this is bad. They are heartbroken. That one of their own, not only did, did he sell out and, and conspire against Jesus and then, uh, and then receive money uh, in order to, to sell him out, and then, but then he feels guilty about it and he ends up hanging himself from a tree and we don't know what happens there, but his guts, it could be that he's hung there for a while and he was bloated and it says his, his guts fall out. I mean, it's just nuts. And the disciples know all this. And they're like, how do, I, how do we process this? What do we do with this? And Peter's their leader. And Peter says, let's go to Scripture. What does Scripture say about it? And when he goes to Scripture, it says, brothers and sisters, the Scriptures had to be fulfilled. And which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas. He says, the Scriptures talk about this. I want to talk to you about the struggle we're going through because the Scriptures talked about it. That's what a good leader should do. It had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke a lot long ago through David concerning Judas. So he's saying this was talked about who served as guide to those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our ministry and shared in our ministry. He's saying, listen, I understand. He was in our ministry. We shared it together. With the payment he received for his wicked wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. That's pleasant. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field in their language uh, Akeldim, Akeldama, that is field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written, here's what the Bible says in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. So that is an Old Testament passage long, 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 long ago, before Jesus ever showed up, talking about Judas. And Peter recognizes it. Wow. And it says, may another take his place of leadership. Wow. So now there's specific stuff. And so Peter's looking at scripture. He's guiding these believers of 120. And he says, hey, uh, we got to do something here. Scripture says that we need to replace. He needs to be replaced by somebody else. So we have to do that. Okay. If we look at, um, I'll go back to, to Judas being a believer. Was he a believer? Here's a couple things I wrote down about him being a believer. Uh, John 17, 12 says, No one has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, though that scripture would be fulfilled. He's stealing the entire time. He's a proactive participant in the murder of the second member of the Trinity. Uh, he's a member that fell away. He was never a true believer. He takes the money uh, and uses it for himself. So they are ready to replace him. What are the qualifications to replace an, uh, an apostle, a disciple? Right, one of the twelve. That's kind of a big job, right? You don't kind of you know put that on Indeed or uh, or a Zip Recruiter or you know put an ad in the paper for hey we're looking for a disciple. We're wondering if anybody wants to apply, right? It's not like uh you know becoming a pastor at a church. This is a big deal, right? Because they need to, so they have to lay out what are the requirements for this. It says therefore, verse twenty one. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. The Lord Jesus was living among us. So they need somebody that was with the disciples the whole time, from way back to the beginning. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So that's what the qualifications are. Somebody who was with him from the very baptism, watched from Jesus' baptism, watched the whole thing, everything he did, all of his ministry, until he ascended, okay? Until he was and resurrected. It says, with us of his resurrection. And so what do they do? What does the church do when it's time to pick a leader? Right? What do they do? Well, what they do is they make a big petition 
and uh, they put together a, uh, a quorum, and they, uh, they get ballots from the whole congregation, and they find out, does anybody nominate anybody within the church of 120 here to be one of the new disciples? And somebody over there, I don't know, somebody said, hey, how about Bill? Right? And they said, oh, okay, that's sure. All right, well, Bill was never with Jesus before, and, uh, you know, he doesn't even really know anything about the resurrection, but sure. And so somebody else says, oh, how about, how about Frank? Right? And they're throwing stuff out. Is that what happened? No, not at all. No, the disciples met, and they looked, and they said, who is qualified to be a leader in the church? Qualification is somewhat necessary. All right? Very necessary. Who is qualified to fill this position? Okay? And they find out of everybody there that there's only two people they can find, or appears to me, there's only two people there that are even qualified. And so they go, okay, there's two people that are qualified. So what's the next step? All right, well, hey, listen, everybody, we got two folks here. Uh, first guy we got is uh, Bar Sabas. Whenever you see Bar before something, that means son of, right? So, so uh, you know, if you see, uh, like if it says... Uh, Sabbath, that would be the son of Sabbath, right? Or, or uh, Barabbas. When we read about Barabbas, that's the son of Rabbis, right? So, so they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. What did they do? They prayed. They nominated them both, and they prayed. That's good. Did they vote? No, they didn't vote. Why? Because they're not voting. That's not what the Bible tells about picking a disciple. They all put in ballots? No. Why? Because it's not our decision. It's not their decision. Jesus picked the 12 disciples. Jesus picked his leadership. God picked the leadership. Now we've got an open spot. There's somebody supposed to replace it. They don't know who it's supposed to be. They know what the qualifications are, but they don't know it's one. So they vote? No. Let's see what happens. It says, so they nominated two men, Joseph, son of Barsabbas, and Matthias, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Why did they pray and pray to God? Because they don't know Barsabbas' heart and they don't know Matthias' heart. Just like I don't know your heart and you don't know my heart. We don't know what's in people's hearts. We don't know their motivation, but God does. And so this sounds radical to you, but it says, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you choose. They basically say, God, we're going to give you the ability to make the decision to take over the ap apostolic ministry, which Judas left, to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots. What does that mean? They rolled dice. Evans Matthias. Odds bar Sabas. All right, God, you control this. You're in total control. Yeah, and you think if that's nuts, you think that's nuts. I'm not saying that we're going to go to that as a church government. But I will tell you this, that uh, before I came here, I was looking at some churches before I came to this one, and I ran into a church that makes decisions this way on leadership. This is exactly how they appoint their leadership. They, they find people that are qualified, and they say, God, we leave this in your hands. We are totally surrendered to you. You have total control of what happens. And they allow God to make decisions on who's in their leadership. Is that crazy? I don't think it's crazy at all. I think that's surrendering to God. So they don't vote. They don't vote. At Luke chapter 22, verse uh, 28 to 30, I'll be done here in a minute. It says, you are those who have continued with me in my trials as far as, as my father appointed a kingdom for me. So I do appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They need to be 12 disciples. I was thinking about this this week. This is kind of cool. If you look at the tribes of Israel, there were 12 of them, right? But then remember, there, was, there were two of them that were kind of weird ones, kind of out of the box, right? Because Joseph, actually there was the kids, right? So you have Masa, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, right? So they're kind of, the, and it's kind of the same thing when you look at the disciples. There's 12, but then all of a sudden one of them betrays and so you pull one out and then you put two in, right? You put Paul in and you put, in a, very interesting as you follow along with this, something you can study on your own. And, uh, and, and then talk to me about kind of what you come up with because I'm not quite sure what all that means. But I'm going to close with this. It has to do with Peter and Judas. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? I mean, Peter, Peter ends up being the head of the church. Man, what a, what a, what a 
to me a horrible responsibility to be responsible for the the beginning of the church that's 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 peter and you've got judas judas denies jesus he uh, he he sells him down the river he failed jesus miserably and judas kills himself so one of these guys becomes the leader of the church the other one kills himself and goes to hell and here's the thing that's nuts to me and, and it should be nuts to you it they both had the exact same senior pastor they both had the exact same they had they both had the best of the best when it comes to their pastor his name was jesus they both of them they both of them spent the same amount of time with their pastor like all the time they both soaked in they both they both just sat in his teaching and just drank it in right they both were in the same small group they both were in the same group of 12 they traveled together they had the same brothers right iron sharpening iron they were they're the same ones they both i put my life in your hands you put your life in mine that was what they did they both had the same thing both of these men peter and judas both fail jesus miserably peter when it when jesus needs him the most he comes there before b before him and uh, jesus is being taken and he's at a campfire he's watching jesus from a distance because he doesn't want what's happening to jesus to happen to him and they ask him are you his disciple and he says no i don't know the man i don't know the man a little girl asks him and he says oh i don't know him right he's scared he denies him a and the rooster crows and and peter knows i have i have failed jesus miserably judas after he betrays jesus he, he knows that he's failed jesus miserably and yet one of these guys ends up becoming the leader of the church and the other guy ends up killing himself and going to hell what is the difference between these two people the difference is very very clear is that here's what peter does after peter recognizes that he is a sinner as as he recognizes that he has wronged jesus failed jesus miserably he goes back to Jesus in repentance and says, I have failed you miserably. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I know you can make this right. I'll do whatever you want. I surrender to you. I'm sorry. I, f please forgive me. That's what Peter does. What does Judas do? Judas runs away, doesn't want anything to do, will not go back to Jesus. And he says, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands and I'm just going to off myself. That is exactly the situation that you and I are in today. Exactly the same. Every one of us is in that. Because the Bible says that every one of us has failed Jesus miserably. We have all failed God miserably. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? How many of you know any of them? None of it? Nobody knows a commandment. That's good. Did you know one of them is thou shalt not lie? How many, how many people ever lie in here? Anybody ever lie? Am I the only liar? I'm a liar. We got one liar. Me and Annie are the only liars. We've committed lies. We've, we've lied. What is that? That makes us liars. You ever com commit adultery? Somebody say, well, I never committed adultery. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Anybody ever commit adultery? Yes. I am a lying adulteress or adulterer. I guess I'm not an adulteress. I'm an adulterer. Have you ever stole anything? You ever cheat on your taxes? You ever kind of scrunch the numbers probably right so you're a lying adulterous thief right you ever covet you ever you ever, you ever commit any of these crimes that ten commandments is there to show you and help you understand that you have failed god miserably and so i ask you are you going to go to heaven all of you all of you adulterous, lying, fornicating, adulterers. You like it when the pastor preaches that way? Hey, all of you lying, adulterous, fornicating, murderers. Right? If you're angry with your brother, you've committed a murder. We're all murderers. We're, we're all that. All of us are that way. You are bad. 
I hate to be the, the I guess I, I'm not preaching what you want to hear. You're all so good and God loves you and he's just going to accept you. That's what you want to hear. The truth is you're all evil. You're all bad just like me and we all deserve hell. You go, well, I don't deserve hell. Why would I go to hell? Because I've, because I, I've, diso listen, you're a lying, adulterous, I've committed, you're a murderer, whatever. Well, yeah, but God's nice. Well, will that work for you in court? Is that going to work for you in court? If you go to court and you go into the courtroom and the, the judge says, uh, well, you're completely guilty of murder and lying and perjury and stealing, but you know what? I'll just let you go. Does that work? No, because everybody looks at the judge and says, that guy's a moron. That guy's a jerk. I'm not, I'm not, that guy's not, ju that, guy's, that judge isn't good. God is a good judge. He is a good God and he has to punish sin. There has to be punishment for sin. There has to be uh, Reckon, there has to be something done because of our sin. He can't just let it go. And so because we deserve to be death, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. What are wages? That's what you earn. Because you're a liar, because you lied, because you stole, because you committed adultery, because you murdered, what you've earned, your big paycheck is you've earned separation from God. You've earned hell. Eternity in, away from God. Eternity in hell. That's what you've earned. But God loves you. That's the bad news. Is that we all are on our way to hell because we're all bad. But the good news is that Jesus wants us to be like Peter and not like Judas. He wants us to come back after we recognize that we have sinned. After we recognize that we have failed Jesus miserably. He wants us to come back and say, you know what? I am so sorry. But I believe you, Jesus, have done everything with your death and resurrection. You have done everything. You died where I was supposed to die. And because you died for my sin, instead of me dying for my sin, it was supposed to be me, but you died in my place because you love me so much. And I receive that free gift of salvation. It is only because of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection that we are saved. It's not by any good things that I do. Because as good as I am, if I'm really good and I'm like, I'm going to be good today, I still am a murderer because I still have murdered. I still am an adulterer because I've committed adultery. I'm still a liar because I've lied. You can't erase that. And so all of us have a decision. Will we be like Peter or will we be like Judas? Recognize that you have failed God miserably. But he is calling you now and saying, repent. The horrible thing that awaits you because you have wronged me and hurt me, the horrible thing that awaits me, or that awaits you, the horrible thing that awaits you can be avoided because of what I did. The good news is that though you deserve to die for that, the wages of sin is death, I'll pay that wage. I will die in your place. And so Jesus dies. He conquers death. And he says this is by faith. It's by trusting that Jesus really did die for our sins. That he really did die in our place. That we have eternal life. That we have eternal life. So right now we're going to pray. And there might be some of you that are saying, man, I never heard that, Dustin. That is bad news. I didn't know I was bad in, before God. I thought I was good. I thought I was going to get into heaven because I'm good. I try to be good. You're not good. Nobody's good. When people tell you, and when church people tell you you're good, it's not for your own good, it's for their own. They want to make you feel good so you'll stay here. The truth from Scripture is that you should stay here because you're in a relationship with God and His people. Because Jesus has redeemed us and saved us all. Okay, That's why we're here. Not because we're all good and we want to be with other good people. We're all people who have failed Jesus and we come back to him. We say, Jesus, you paid the price for our sin. God, we commit ourselves to you. We, like Peter, we come back to you and we are sorry. God, I feel bad that I have sinned. Just pray with me right now. God, I am sorry. I am sorry. I am, if I'm honest, I am an adulterer. I've, I've looked at people lustfully. I've lied, so I'm a liar. I'm a, I, I've, I've stolen in some way. I'm, I'm a thief. I'm a murderer. I've, I've hated my brother. God, I, I'm all those things, God, and you're a holy God, and, 
and the wages of sin, the wages of doing that, what I deserve is death, God, but, but you died on the cross for me. God, I don't want to, I don't want to die for my sin. Don't let me die for my sin, please. Oh, you died already for me. God, apply your death to the death I deserved. Apply that to me. God, I put my trust in that death, that death on the cross. When you were hanging on that cross and you died, I put my faith in that and nothing else. I don't put my faith in my goodness. If that's you today, we've got our heads bowed here. If that's you and you're thinking, you know what, Dustin, I believe that. I am. I, I, I'm accepting that gift of salvation. God, you've saved me from what I deserve. If that's you, uh, kind of with your heads bowed here, uh, just so that I know, just, just put your hand up real quick so I can know that, that you're making that decision or, or uh, at least look up at me so that I can see that you're making that decision. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You got it, buddy. Jesus loves you. Jesus did everything necessary for you to have a relationship with him. The bad news is that we are sinners. We've broken his law. The good news is that he's fixed it. Anybody else? You can look up at me. God, thank you this morning for our chance to meet together. And God, we're going to wait. We're going to wait for you. God, you've got big plans for us. You've got, you've got a mission for us. We're going to be witnesses here in Atkinson and in Anawan and around the other towns. God, we're going to be those witnesses. We're waiting for you to fill us with your spirit. God, but as we wait, we are going to constantly be in prayer. We're going to join together in fellowship. And we're going to be led by the scriptures, God. And we're going to expect with great anticipation you to do great things in our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, we'll be back here next week. And uh, hopefully some of you sign up for the evangelism class at 7 o'clock at our uh, Facebook Live page. Okay, it's also on the website too. You can go to the website and it's on there too for folks who don't have Facebook. So uh, that's good. Some people are anti-Facebook. And so we want to minister to folks that are anti-Facebook as well. So uh, the, the whole gamut. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Facebook people and anti-Facebook people. And we want to minister to all those people. So we'll be on our website. Have a great day. Have a great Sunday.